Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Ocean Bunker podcast. Uh, today is season four, episode 11. Um, we're recording this a little bit later uh, than we normally would, so it's um, shortly after 11 p.m. Uh, local time in the UK. Um, I'm probably going to regret this in the morning, given I still have work tomorrow, but we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm joined this evening by my co-host, as usual, OSINT Technical, and we are joined this evening as well by our guest, uh, Intel Crab. Um, Crab, how many followers is it you have now? Um, I've probably lost, uh, due to the, the great Twitter purge, almost maybe 10,000 this month, but I think like 280,000, something like, something like that. I was going to say, for, for, for a long while, I think you were the largest sort of account in the community, and then Technical decided to do technical things this year, and he's sort of leapfrogged you a little bit, hasn't he? It's a worthy at, at title. Great, at great expense to my <laughs> mental health. Let's, let's, I, there, there was some stuff left behind there, trust me. Yeah, you <laughs> can't do it all. Sacrificed. <laughs> oh, I almost did, trust me. Got, got pretty close during uh, the initial uh, stages of the invasion. I was not really sleeping for like a month. I, I think I did a week. I, I had a uh, a girlfriend at the time, and I think she, uh, by day four uh, she threatened to kick me out. So I had to I had to go back to being a normal human being, so to speak. But I'm glad you kept it up. I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult, <laughs> but we'll, I'll say, take, it, <laughs> take it as a compliment. Given, given conversations that we've had, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that any of us are normal human beings, but... Um, no, it's the kind of comes with the territory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. Uh, yeah. yeah, so tonight we're going to be discussing uh, a little bit about Intel Crab and his background. Um, we're also inevitably going to be talking about developments in you Ukraine Russia conflict. Um, we may touch on some other suspect uh, suspects subjects if we have time. Um, goodness me, you can tell I'm tired. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll we'll see where the evening takes us. Uh, but I'm hoping it won't be for too long. Otherwise, I'll probably fall asleep at the keyboard. Yeah, that might be entertaining, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> and until you have to edit down a uh, 25 hour long clip or something yeah of john just like sleeping <laughs> oh man yeah <laughs> um oh boy lost my train of thought there a tiny bit on um, that note we shall uh, <laughs> throw it open to uh intel crab um would you like to introduce yourself and just tell our listeners a little bit about you i mean um i'm somehow weirdly been on twitter for a really really long time um yet i am also probably one of the youngest people on here um my real name is justin of course um i kind of came out so to speak with my identity earlier this year um so it's been kind of crazy with that but yeah i joined twitter back in god i have to look actually right now as embarrassing that is uh 2000 2015. So I was a 14 uh, year old kid. Um, I think I uh, was in my parents' room, and um, you know I was always the World War II kid in middle school. You know, just uh, obsessed with history, and um, you know Russia's annexation of Crimea just fascinated me um, to the point of obsession as a kid. And you know. I made this Twitter account uh, at the time. It had some fake. I was essentially uh, pretending to be a uh, Ukrainian kid that lived in Ukraine. Um, I think I had a fake, um, some sort of Cyrillic stereotypical name. And for two or three years there, I essentially lurked through a lot of the community pages in the Donetsk region in particular. Um, and, you know, a year or two in, I kind of realized I'm like, I'm sitting on a lot of, you know, individuals, you know, not correspondents or analysts or, you know, whoever. I'm sitting on a bunch of real people um, that live in Ukraine, that live in this, you know, violent area of the world. And um, when the invasion, of course, began earlier this year, I kind of realized I'm like, I am, you know, sitting on a lot of, you know, really valuable um, first-hand accounts, so to speak, um, documenting their life, you know, during the war. And, um, I mean, that's, that's kind of weirdly, I invested all of that time back then and it really, it really paid off this year. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wish it didn't. 
Um, but yeah, I've been doing this, whatever you want to call this, so to speak, um, since middle school. Yeah, there, there, there seems to be like distinct waves of kind of people that like sort of came into the community from an enthusiast like again there there are like different parts of the open source intelligence community those being you know you're you're entrenched came over from other parts of the intelligence community and you know developing osint from that point of view which is mostly locked down and stuff and then you have the people who sort of came up in that social media sphere um and and developed those skills and those tools to learn or to learn and develop um uh, uh the ability to sort of communicate some of the harder elements of you know events that are happening you know um that a lot of news services couldn't do until they started doing open source intelligence stuff which you know great um but i i really do think that sort of those at least kids basically who who grew up on that you know grew up on social media and instead of you know trolling around on facebook and stuff decided to go on twitter and other sort of niche social media services and and go look up you know conflict areas and research that and it's incredibly interesting to sort of see how that's developed and and how that's matured at least as you know a lot of us are starting to you know, graduate from college now or in the later stages of, of sort of their academic careers and, and you know, what we're continuing to do as as we see things, you know, happen in Ukraine. Um, a lot of what we've been doing for a while has become a bit more pertinent. I like, you know, what you said with the media too, that was, that was one of the biggest, you know, for a kid who just wanted to consume and consume, you know, content from Ukraine. That was one of the reasons I jumped onto Twitter um, is I didn't feel there was the mainstream media coverage um, that that I expected from something I was so fascinated with. Um, and, you know, it, it was such a an immersive way to learn about not only, you know, the conflict, of course, um, but the country itself. I always joke to people, you know, uh, consistently learning about this part of the world for almost six years now. I mean, I know... An embarrassing amount, unfortunately, about, you know, the Donetsk area and surrounding, you know, suburbs in particular, that's always been my fascination. Um, just this huge, you know, sprawling metropolitan area that's um, essentially been a frontline city for almost a decade now. I've always been fascinated in that. And, um, you know, as I grew and as I, you know, matured and, and, and you know, learned new things contextually and, and starting to get into sort of the analytical process it's still really all kind of ties into the fact that look uh, um there's no centralized location to find out more i can either you know go dehydrated from this content never know more or i can you know move to social media and you know find out for myself and um i mean yeah 14 years old i think that's i think that's basically what pushed me to be on here and still on here sadly <laughs> yeah it's kind of interesting how we've sort of used the same analytical techniques and sort of the 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 same baseline understanding but just focused in different areas of course you know i've constantly sort of been the middle east guy i mean i've, I've gone and lived there i've you know i i had some was very lucky to have very good professors who you know helped me do that who who you know helped me go live in the Middle East and, and give me a, a bunch of background information. Um, but I, 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 it really is interesting to see how these basic analytical techniques can kind of cross over between different domains. Um, especially a lot of the stuff that we were using to acquire information out of the Middle East um, applied very well. Um, except in Ukraine, the, the, the information environment was even more soaked. Um, with with sort of stuff getting released normally normally trying to get stuff out of out of middle of nowhere or rock um, yes. is is a bit more difficult because it because it always gets filtered through different basically propaganda channels yes. um, and and so uh, utilizing a lot of remote sensing tools and, and and other features to sort of put together a picture um, it it's basically the the playing OSINT on hard mode <laughs> actually no that's 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 North Korea that's that's anyone <laughs> who's, who's doing North literally Korea in the dark. Yeah. 
having having no social media resources and no regular information coming to, out. To be fair, North Korea OSIN is pretty much looking at photos of Kim and analyzing how much cheese he's eaten. <laughs> Hey, that's that's very important. We, there, was, there was a lot of discussion last year how sick he was from COVID and you know his his weight post COVID weight loss. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of focus on remote sensing tools in in that domain. But you know, it's it's the same remote sensing tools you use to watch you know North Koreans build nuclear testing facilities, and and you can translate that experience over to looking at Russian troop buildup. Um, which the, the the same tools were used for both, and and were used to to acquire an incredible amount of information. It's just with the Russian buildup, you had extra information on top to characterize what you were seeing through said remote sensing platforms and tools. Um, and I I think that's very interesting to sort of see how that. And I, again, I'll say developed because I'm I'm looking over you know a, a ten year period here. Um, but yeah, seeing sort of that that entire field grow and mature it has been very interesting especially you know being in it for so long the north korea guys you touched on it the the osint analysts the arms control uh what's, what's that guy's name oh somebody help me uh i think i don't know there's, there's a guy he, yes or, i mean that is that is pioneering um sort of you know confluence of you know defense studies and open source intelligence i mean he, i i remember you know looking through threads of his way back in the uh you know obama era you know nuclear crisis sort of deal i mean he completely you know working with nothing you know there's no social media to aggregate from there you're working with you know whether state controlled media whatever they release um satellite information and you know that's about it and they've built a really, really dynamic, um, you know, sector of the community. And, you know, any time there's a nuclear missile test or, or a ballistic missile test, rather, I mean, it takes them five, ten minutes and they know the exact airbase. Um, they can even kind of estimate maybe the aperture it was launched at. Um, I, mean, I mean, really, really intelligent uh, part of the community. And I don't know how they do it. <laughs> I really don't. I mean, they have, they have nothing tactile to, to work with yeah i mean it's relying on curated information um fortunately the north koreans sort of screw up frequently um <laughs> which is which is good for for going through their information that they put out um although, although there are certain side effects to that um they 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 have the tendency to uh, get rid of individuals who screw up so very true yeah, on on that dark note, <laughs> Ukraine. Oh man. Um, yeah. Uh, at least fighting in the south has cooled down. Yeah, I, it's I, def it's it's been a you know watching the withdrawal from Kyrgyzstan, you know, almost a month ago. Is that correct at this point? Uh, yeah, I think we're at about a month. On three weeks, um, just getting used to the fact that that's not really, I don't want to say an active front, so to speak, but uh, just no longer really using that word in my vocabulary, uh, talking about the war in Ukraine is very weird to me still. Um, obviously, that whole area is still relevant, but um, just... Ooh, should, should we should we talk about disinformation and the, the, the rise of people believing that the Ukrainians were uh, crossing the Dnipro? To, to make an amphibious landing I, I, the same two uh shaky videos that just uh vaguely show a body of water um and guys on dinghies <laughs> no guys they're 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 definitely i i i i mean and and that is one area where osint can kind of fall flat and i know we talked about this last week but um unconfirmed stuff that sort of forms narratives and people not taking sort of a step back and sort of seeing you know, the Ukrainians just had to to clear a fairly large amount of territory, and there was no real indication that they had massed, you know, any forces to make an amphibious crossing. And you're you're trying to say they 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 made a large opposed, you know, crossing across a, a, a fairly large body of water against Russian forces in the area, and then then what are they going to do after that? Just kind of sit there, like they're. they're there really was no no real reasoning. 
no, and you know it, it happened all so quickly, and uh, you know that that's that's when information like that is is the most prone to spread, and uh, you know especially when you're a college student turned uh, you know working as I do at my local TV job, so to speak. It's 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 when the most action is in motion, so to speak, that I you know a lot of people get carried away and. Uh, totally, constantly, uh, through <laughs> through my time on here, always have been uh, carried away myself. Yeah, maybe um, maybe I should trademark. I know I know I've already made up. Uh, you know, I made it up int, but maybe feel good int. You know, the the sort of the it's like a break off of hopium. Um, oh yeah. The, the the idea that you know if we believe in this enough, it'll happen. You know, if we if I post about this happening, you know, it it, it must be true because you know it's good. It's it's and good for our narrative. That's an entirely new concept, just off and on the record, that has kind of emerged during this conflict. Is any sort of, and I'm not saying I would ever do this, and I don't think I've ever publicly claimed this at least. Uh, but anytime you're wrong, uh, so to speak, when you're obviously doing this partisan sort of narrative control, uh, you know, you you can claim essentially you're hiding behind that sort of hope, or you're hiding toward you know. Uh, informational warfare. Uh, I won't name any accounts, but there's an account uh, that shared something, dis- you know, deliberately debunked, uh, deliberately false, and uh, you know, called him out for it. And he's like, "Well, I was just trying to, you know, for the cause, so to speak, or trying to, you know, spread misinformation." And um, just, you know, a lot of people can really kind of, uh, you know, go beyond neutral work and and at least claim to be active you know informational agents in this conflict and that's just that's still a really new concept to me i I mean i think we saw it in the middle east obviously there's a lot of um a lot of tensions there for a variety of reasons that fall on both racial religious ethnic nationalistic grounds you know pick 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 one there's probably a few more sort of interspersed within that dynamic um, at, at any at any one time. Um, but I don't think it was as widespread. I don't think it gained as much um, prevalence, at least in the English speaking world. Like, obviously, there are select journalists who, you know, again, won't name specific ones. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, they, they come from publications who are openly in support of X movement or, you know, X organization. Um, and, and, you know, will post content that has a clear slant, but I, I, I don't think anyone could, I I don't think it ever rose to the straight up, you know, I am posting false information to win the information war battle space, or, or I don't think there was ever open admittance of that. Um, probably even, even to the poster themselves. Um, so I, I, I do think, yeah, it is a bit of a novel thing to see people openly admitting it. Um, I think there's a lot to to dig in there about, you know, a, 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 a not partisanship, but tribalism um, in that sort of people have found their, you know, their their tribe of, you know, we're going to defeat the Russians and they will sort of pose as this independent individual, but but also sort of want to see a certain result, um, and 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 it'll taint their their information output, um, and we we do see that frequently, I I think, and and I I think we'll probably continue to see it, um, in in whatever happens next, um. I mean, I I think it's a bit more common with this conflict because of how little moral gray area there is um at least among you know russian actions you know like shelling civilian targets you know dropping cluster munitions into the center of kharkiv you know uh, uh, killing basically half the population of mariupol um there's there's all these things where it's it's just you know it is really hard to be on the side of the Russians while still trying to maintain some sort of moral high ground. And most of the individuals who are doing that are just straight up delusional or, or don't actually believe it. Um, or, you know, your, your standard Russian propagandists. Um, and so I think when there is sort of that clear dividing moral line, 
it's really easy to fall into that, you know, just straight up rooting for Ukraine and and having it cloud any potential analysis or or information. Um, I I do think that is common, and and I think it's I think it's detractive too. At the end of the day. I I think there are a lot of people, whether they would admit it or not, um, you know, when they're shifting from an analytical role to a like I said, you know, information warfare or psych ops or however you want to describe that. You know, this is going to be a conflict that is inevitably won on the ground. Um, you know, we work with so many images and see so many faces of people that are putting, you know, their life on the line. I'm not going to be the guy in the chair, nor is anybody in the community, for that matter, that is doing anything remotely equivalent to that work, which which is the work that deserves not only to be praised, um, but to be analyzed and to be respected. And um, I just, I don't, I think a lot of these people have really, they've built up a, a bit of, I don't want to say an ego, so to speak. Um, but, you know, there's only one way to truly contribute, and that's to get your booty on the ground. And, yeah, you know, I, I, I've tried to step away from that. I think it comes off as virtue signaling. Uh, you know, I, I will keep my little crab with the Ukraine flag, you know, of course. Um, you have to there if you cared enough you would be there <laughs> so to speak and um you therefore you can't you can't work in the mindset that everything you're doing um is this just masterful you know offensive against you know russian disinformation yeah i do think there is the temptation to sort of i i don't know the best way to put this but but sort of act like you are contributing to the war effort from your chair. Right. Um, and that, as we, we talked about this last week, but that there, there has been this, this war has been characterized heavily by social media involvement, whether that be, you know, fundraising or paying for your name to be put on our, on, our, on an artillery shell or, you know, people locating Russian columns and then, you know, sending the information over to Ukrainian commanders. Um, I I think that it, it basically it snowballed into people thinking that they could be involved in the war from their chair, from their desk, from the U.S. or Europe or wherever, um, and sort of make an impact in the informational space and in the, in the informational battle space. Um, you know, I think we saw that heavily with NAFO basically just bullying. Just to, um, <laughs> I was okay. just about to bring it up. <laughs> NAFO bullying Russians on Twitter is objectively funny. It is Correct. incredibly amusing. <laughs> I don't think they're doing much. Um, I, I there, they, there definitely was an element of that earlier on um, with, you know, Russian attempts at false flags and trying to control the narrative, but that, that broke down so quickly and so heavily. Um, in the early days of the war, when pretty much every Russian narrative was counteracted pretty much immediately by people who were just doing the re doing research and, and, and looking into things from that open source point of view. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think no, that's no, the first time I had heard of <laughs> NAFO, I think was in Mariupol and uh, the, the steel mill um, where there's the, the, uh, concentrated, uh, you know, Russian propaganda effort, uh, uh, you know, that they're faking all of the victims, you know, that are bunkered, you know, deep in the in the, the tunnels, so to speak. And I, I think, and I'd have to look because that would that would have been May June, but I, I think that's when I really started to, I, I guess, see the phrase, see the expression, so to speak. Um, and I think they were very effective collectively at, at destroying that narrative because I remember quite a few weeks there where there would be, you know, daily photos published, whether it be, you know, through state run, you know, social media websites or uh, state run media rather that, you know, there were fake uh, armbands and fake, um, you know, walkers and stuff of all of these injured civilians under the under the factory and. Um, they were really kind of pivotal and and debunking a lot of that, and I think that's really the first time I encountered them. And definitely, looking through my replies today, <laughs> they are they are everywhere. So they have definitely grown into their own. Yeah, I I think it is a big element right now 
not to say that it again the the effects are debatable and there will i think constantly or be a debate on on sort of what people are in doing and and you know people may believe that they are fighting in it and you know sure they they may be but the the impacts are definitely questionable and it it, it comes down to in effect what the narratives are um and and who has control of those narratives um i i i do think that will continue to be a question when you brought it up earlier too we said it as a joke but you know talking about that first month where you were so you know occupied and busy so to speak um you know that was a you know really kind of dawning point in the fact for me personally that you know this i am nothing more than you know an occasional observer um if 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 this was indeed something that i was having any any direct you know recordable effect on i wouldn't be able to step away for two days and work on my you know midterm project or uh go to work for four days you know what i mean there's no um day off for those who are truly putting their all in and um you know that was a wake-up call to me it's like this is over there i am here i have the luxury of being here i have the luxury of this being something you know, I can invest time into and, you know, focus less on quantity, less on, um, you know, the eye emoji, so to speak, and more on occasional insightful work. And, um, you know, I really didn't realize, come to that realization, though, until just getting so brutally burnt out back in February. Yeah, and I I think that will that is always an issue and and will continue to be an issue. I I know Bellingcat, you know, has made statements or at least contributed to the general idea of, you know, sanitizing your work to to, you know, not impact yourself greatly. Um and that that is that is a huge element of or a huge risk behind doing open source intelligence work is that exposure um uh, uh to the content itself. Um, I think that that definitely was really hard during the first month. Um, I, I, I wouldn't attempt to say, you know, uh, looking at things on social media is, you know, in any way equivalent to what people went through that in Ukraine or, or what people experienced or basically anything, but it, it, you know, it definitely was impactful. Um, and, and, and that, that is an element to remember is 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 definitely to to sanitize some of the work that you do and and ensure that you are sort of taking care of yourself as well um that does burn out a lot of people especially the people who are doing some of the most important work of tracking war crimes and 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 nailing down things that are happening you know crimes against civilians crime various crimes against humanity um uh you know war crimes committed by members of the military and and against other members of the military um and i i definitely think that that does tend to burn some of the more the 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 researchers who go after the most concerning things and the the researchers who pursue the most violent events um i i i definitely think it it does have that level of harm um to to sort of diving into what's happening in general um and and the more that happens there you know the the worse it gets the worse it gets for the general informational environment it it burns people out and, and you know i think the thing and i think i've told quite a few people this is of course there is the personal burnout and the personal uh sort of drain i felt of course i also felt especially getting into some of uh, the sort of fear mongering that we saw kind of originally back in February, March, and then um, again, September, October with, you know, all of the, you know, tactical nuclear weapon talk, uh, you started to realize, especially when you're you're building a, a platform that is quite sizable, that you're kind of filling a lot of your followers, a lot of people that uh, I don't want to say are um, naive, so to speak, but but could be very moldable or impact, you know, easily influenced. Uh, you're kind of making them very much afraid. Um, I, I can't tell you how many people 
reached out to me in February, um, you know, not even exclusively in Ukraine or Eastern Europe. We're talking Austin, Texas or Chicago, Illinois, you know, tell I am scared. <laughs> I am, you know, I am scared of, of what is to come. I am scared of the world we're about to live in. And, you know, the greatest thing I tell people is, is the saddest thing is that we have the luxury of being here. <laughs> we, we have the luxury of, of, of being not there. And um, all we can do is observe and document for posterity. Um, and, and, you know, I only bring it up because I, I really do feel that a lot of people, whether they meant to or not, really kind of were scaring others. And, um, it, you know, war is scary. It's intrinsically scary. It's undeniably scary. Um, I I had to shift the nature of, of what I did February into March just because I felt terrible. Um, and I had a lot of people telling me that, you know, this is you know, something that is nonstop 24 seven like that, you're never going to come ahead. <laughs> you're never going to get to all of it. Um, you know, I was told you need to take care of yourself. And, um, there's, there's a lot of people out there that are really easily shaken. We'll leave it at that. Yeah. I, I mean that, that of course continues to be a, a problem and, and managing that at least for, you know, the general community and, and the general audience as well, you know, trying, trying not to put stuff out. That's just, I mean, again, war is inherently upsetting. Um, being clear that what you are posting and what you are sort of diving into is upsetting is incredibly important to do. Um, you know, to, to make sure your audience understands what's happening. I, I mean, I do believe people should have the, or, or people have the responsibility to sort of know what's happening in the world. I, I have, that is my personal belief that, you know, a good society should be, should be educated on global events. Um, and but but sometimes there there is that understanding that that people don't want to engage with some of that stuff um and and your audience does have an element of self filtering in that people who don't want to engage with that just won't um though there is definitely a question of of what you are putting out and and what you are trying to sanitize and if you're sanitizing content um to to put it out what you're doing um and 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 if you are sort of creating a narrative that might be incorrect because you're sanitizing content um and and that goes back to the question of the 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 hope scent of the are you just putting out news that's good for the ukrainians are you you know are you trying to stay away from that are are you putting out news that's just good for the russians are you sort of on this single track um with without being open about the fact that you know you're watching russian media or you you're a russian media monitor there there are great people who are single track but they're very open about the fact that they're single track um and so i i definitely think that's an element that a lot of people in the community have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis um and and i think audiences should also take that into account of you know what a lot of the questions that we have to take into account are are very difficult and very complex. Yeah, and it's it's um you know it, it, one of the one of the scariest things for me is you know the concept of transparency. Um, I, I find myself personally to be immensely transparent when it comes to personal beliefs, personal convictions. Um, was never something I, you know, ever really anticipated happening. I never wanted to, uh, you know, going beyond just the war in Ukraine, uh, quite a few opinions of mine are publicly known due to my own release and, uh, whether that's good or bad, it's, it's out there now. And, you know, I, I weirdly feel satisfied in that. Uh, I, I would much rather know, you know, be in the know, you know, if the tables were turned, I'm following somebody that I, I have a kind of an ounce of shred of trust in or, or somebody that I even, you know, occasionally view, you know, viewing them as somebody who is human and has, you know, interest and has obvious, you know, implicit bias. I think that's important. 
And, um, you know, what scares me are those who who aren't as transparent with that, um, those that have a larger platform that, you know, are, are very clearly, to me at least, pushing some sort of narrative, some sort of agenda that is unspoken. And, um, you know, the NAFO people uh, or, you know, myself, obviously a big Ukraine flag in my in my bio you know, at, at least that is something transparent and and visible. And, um, you know, I definitely think there's a lot of framing that goes on in the community. And, you know, I noticed that this week there were there were quite a few um, incidents of, of shelling in central Donetsk, which, uh, despite this conflict going on for almost 10 years there, it's, it's a rather rare occurrence. And it's a very um, uh, dramatic occurrence for me because I, I get dozens of notifications from people that live in that central uh, business district there of, of impacts and um, surrounding, you know, possible fires that may occur. And um, people, you know, objectively without any observation, you know, claiming where those impacts came from uh, or, or, you know, claiming who may have fired on, you know, the city. It's definitely not a lot of thought is given to question it otherwise in the community. And um, it's definitely, it can definitely be tricky. Yeah. Um, and managing that even as, as I've found, you know, your audience sort of demands content from you. Um, and, and sometimes it's not just managing expectations, but managing your audience to, respect the situation um in, in a way that you know you're not pushing people towards believing a certain thing and and it's kind of important but also hard to sort of guide an audience towards that especially if they're not as receptive um and there there are people who you know will post narratives because that's what their audience wants and again, that's something that's incredibly difficult to deal with. Um, that's just when you're getting that constant feedback from the people who are reading your content and commenting and retweeting and, 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 you know, it's, it's the people who you are most engaging with on these things. Um, you know, when they get angry at you, that's, that's definitely hard for a lot of people to deal with. Um, and so it, it, some content creators absolutely are bullied towards um, putting out a certain narrative sometimes because the, that's not what the audience wants to hear. And and that's what I, you know, I, I like to remind a lot of the people that have consistently followed me. I've, I, I've actually qu uh, quite often been accused of, of beef with, with other people in the community because, um, and, and you can check the car facts, so to speak, I don't follow many accounts that do similar things to what I do. Um, and a lot of people have thought that somehow, you know, lack of endorsement, perhaps, or some sort of uh, pettiness. To me, it's it's when I'm looking to distribute information, um, you know, especially when it comes to localized information, I don't want to get already regurgitated, um, you know, aggregated content, you know, sharing already shared, already shared, you know, information. It's almost redundant at that point to me. And, um, you know, the whole point being there is when it comes to, you know, you know, getting bullied by your audience, so to speak, into framing an agenda, you know, most people have to realize that 90% of what I put out um, does not come from a second medium like a, you know, a, a fellow aggregator or a fellow analyst or, you know, oftentimes even a, a local news station in the area. It comes from a, you know, a firsthand person <laughs> it comes from a real uh tactile living person that lives in the area of interest and oftentimes you know some of my most controversial tweets so to speak are just uh testimonies that are are theirs and um again you know bringing up the shelling in central donetsk i mean there's there's a gentleman that i followed who lives there for many many years and you know a bus station, unfortunately, uh, was blown up uh, earlier this week. Um, and, you know, how how do you share information like that? 
um, especially with it being a frontline city. So, so it could, you know, in theory go 50, 50, just simply sharing information like that. It, it blew up in my replies quite controversially. And, um, there wasn't even really an ounce of commentary, uh, you know, provided from myself. Yeah. Dealing with that is, you know, it's definitely interesting and and it's something that's very hard to manage as, as you know, I mean, I think we can call ourselves content creators though. That's, that's kind of misleading. We are, we're more towards that journalism side of things um, in, in what we do, but you know, obviously everyone has to deal with an audience and when everything that you're putting out is consumed by a certain audience, it's it's sometimes difficult. And when when you are the monolith, the creator, you know, the 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 outlet, the the everything, um, it's it, it it's sometimes hard when that goes wrong. Yeah, no, it is. And, you know, I liked your comment there with uh, what what we are so to speak i'll tell you one thing is what i've what i've really and a lot of this you have to understand on a personal note this has been a, a crazy year academics wise um i've been a healthcare management major for for two three years i'm a junior now and um a combination of all of the craziness that's occurred to me this year with twitter um along with you know i landed a job at the local tv station i am a journalism major now my my class is focus on the art of of storytelling and the art of you know collecting information and and um you know one of the things i've realized lately that i'm gravitated towards doing whether that be on twitter or 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 anything is i I like that art or that practice of telling a story um I, i really you'll notice a lot of my tweets this year in particular they're almost always accented by some sort of image or or map in particular regardless of how redundant the map may look um i even do that weird spinny google earth sort of animation you know this the audience that i have i want to say is 60 percent to 80 percent within the western world if not higher than that um i think uh maybe one percent has ever actually visited ukraine and um you know, to me, one of the greatest uh, thrills of mine, so to speak, is when I get to explore an area that is so alien to me or foreign to me and, you know, make it seem to an audience like it's a bit more intimate to them. Oftentimes that is through using a map or through using, you know, primary images and videos and, and telling a story, even a really, really small, benign war related story through those tweets, you know, I never would have thought that's something I'd really take great pride or 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 interest in doing on my platform. Uh, but you know, scrolling through my tweets from the last week or so, I mean, that is more or less what I do. And um, it's just, I guess, kind of the whole point being, it's you can definitely shift your purpose on here often often overnight yeah and and because we are these these mono or mono account mono personality accounts um i'll i'll come up with a new term for that at some point um (laughs) but i i think that you know when when we are the sort of district again author distributor content creator everything um that that interrelation can cause issues um other other people who you know work behind organizations certainly have a bit more uh, not just rigor in stuff like fact checking and 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 def- sort of this defense basically that that's built in it is they are working for a publication and and they are defended by said publication for a lot of us it is you know if we fuck up it's it's us fucking up it's not anything else um so uh, there is that sort of risk behind everything. Yeah, and you, you really you have nobody to disappoint other than your audience, and you have nobody really um, to satisfy other than your audience. And, um, you know, I think you ultimately accept you can do neither. And inevitably, whether it be for me, 
uh, six years into having your account, or perhaps from day one, you accept that you won't have either, uh, and you really want to do your own thing. And, um, you know, this has been a year where I, I feel very much like um, I am more attracted to, as I said, more of the art of storytelling, revealing and showcasing, you know, what is typically just a headline on a newspaper showing what that looks like and what the people look like there and, and, you know, what, what they complain about and what they're into. Um, you know, that, that's something that is not really desired by anybody. I think that follows me. Um, but you know, you can't make everyone happy. So try your best, especially now that I'm starting to get into the mindset of portfolio building and building a repertoire of work I can show other people in the future. I'm going to try at least to be doing, you know, stuff that is appealing to me um, while also not alienating everyone at the same time. And, well, I think it's so, impossible. So far, so good. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I definitely think it's impossible not to alienate anyone. To, no one will or everyone will never all be happy. That's that's good grammar, right? Yeah. I'm I'm good at English. Yes. Um, but yeah, it, it is impossible to make everyone happy all the time. Um, and, and you, you know, you will have people who are angry. You'll have people who just, you know, they just aren't happy. They 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 legitimately, you know, just don't like what you're doing sometimes. And so that's 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 hard to deal with as 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 a creator. Um, and and. Yeah, again, learning how to take criticism is sometimes different from people just getting angry at you. Yeah, it, it's tough. And, and, you know, I think that's one of the best things. And I'm just I'm making an inference here, of course, because you kind of hinted at it. We being either fresh out of college or in our studies, perhaps, or, or very close to it. Um, you know, it's a period in our life and I, and I can very much compare it. Uh, you want to see me three years ago versus three now is, of course, I don't feel like I had that sort of deep analytical process quite developed yet back then. But I also had no possible idea or or way to deal with criticism. Criticism uh, was a concept that scared me. Um, it made me feel like I was doing something innately bad, innately wrong. And, um, you know, going through my studies as I have and, and above all, you know, joining, you know, I work at a TV station owned by, you know, Nexstar, which I mean is a, a Fortune 500 company. Huge. Uh, I mean, they own thousands, hundreds of stations across the United States. I've had to learn very quickly that you need to accept criticism. It is a part of life. Um, but if it could be done constructively, um, it's it's a free handout essentially on how to do better and reform. And um, you know, like I said, three years ago, um, even even at the top of the year, I mean, I had a platform. Um, of course, that was somehow the easy part. It was using it for good, so to speak, and accepting that I can't always be right. And above all, and I, I think you would all either giggle and agree internally or outright agree can't be an expert on everything mm. uh, i am not an expert on anything <laughs> but i am able to comfortably now say that and also accept that there is there is a joy and a liberation in not being an expert you get away with a lot uh by not being able to hide behind the fact that you have qualifications, if that makes any sense. And I that, mean, that's all been a learning process. I disagree. I'm I'm pretty much perfect at everything. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I can see that. Yeah, I, was, yeah, I, they, I don't they, think I've never done anything say that about your editing, but um, <laughs> John, John, you would literally be nowhere without my editing. The podcast <laughs> wouldn't happen. No, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Complain about the terrible editing, but it's still editing. <laughs> Yeah, you got it done. I just figured out how to noise gate last week. That was that was a good one. Yeah. No more no more hyper annoying high pitch sounds. I I consider that a massive win. Um Anyway, I I think we were talking about Ukraine and Russia and we've um we we've drifted somewhat easily off of that, which is a surprise when technical's talking about it, but um 
I think there was one or two little sort of events this week that you particularly wanted to mention. Me? Uh, yeah, something uh, about um, Russian uh, military I mean, barracks. Oh yeah, I think I think Crab is far more um, <laughs> knowledgeable about what happened. I more, I have been an expert, living... or are we not using <laughs> we're not using that phrase. <laughs> no, we'll say knowledgeable because no one's an expert, right? Yeah, nobody nobody can possibly be an expert in all of the niche stuff that we mentioned. It would be cool. I could I could try. I hit the mute. No, I'm here. Oh my god, I have a uh, a mute button on the side of my headphones. No, I mean if you're re- if you're referring to um, the resort strike earlier this week, I mean that that particular story of of that site. Um, so I, I use one of one of my favorite resources, and I'm not sure if you guys often use it. I, I don't like to advertise it often, main, mainly because. Uh, it seems to go offline for me uh, virtually every week at this point. Um, but it's Wikimapia, of course. I'm, I'm sure you guys have used it. Um, it is a great, great tool when you're when you're looking for that hyper local um, sort of corner by corner context that we so often miss when it comes to you know scrolling around on Google Earth and you know uh, there is when, immediately after the report of this of this airstrike um, in Melitopol I I heard it was near a church I heard it was at a church actually and um, it was um, I think a Pravda Ukraine article that came out regarding the strike and I believe their photo I have that infographic um, that I kind of dissected. That's a photo that a journalist with them took. That was they 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 d- described it as a Christian church, and um, you know I went into the Wikimapia sort of search function, and there were maybe six or seven churches in the town, and um, they were all Orthodox um, or some subset of Orthodoxy. I think there was a um, perhaps Catholic cathedral there as well. But then you got to remember, I live in Alabama. Uh, there is this weird, like, mega church. <laughs> like, it looked like something right out of the southern United States here. And um, it, as it turned out, you know, looking through the area, it was not a strike on the church, but this really weird, and I, I'm still really struggling to figure out what exactly the nature of the complex is. Um, restaurant resort airbnb thing i i really don't know for the life of me um but you know long story short uh, i drove past it i think on in yandex uh, their street view feature because uh, i think they were the only map cover in the area and it was it was yeah it was indeed a strike on this restaurant slash sauna slash gift shop slash also petting zoo i'm told um just a massive sprawling complex here right next to a um local church in town that's definitely interesting i i know it's sometimes weird when you know some of these or or at least trying to locate things where people use local parlance or, or local language to sort of describe, you know, a, a place or or a town and, and there is no way to sort of understand it. And then you'll go to Wikim- Wikimapia and like, oh, this name is like a local name for it that comes from X, Y, and Z. And like, here's the history behind the name and here's why it's different on the map. And it's incredibly interesting sometimes to sort of see that I guess. Well, and it and it's such a great tool. I I I can't remember who I spoke to earlier over the summer about it. Um, this was actually when it was offline. I think they took I, they pulled the plug on the servers um, in the months after the invasion, uh, probably because they're just being DDoSed daily. I'm going to assume. Um, but you know what I always tell people is if there is ever you know a war that broke out tomorrow in your town and you know you're thrown on camera to talk about where this big mortar strike happened, you're not often going to say it occurred at you know ten fifteen twelve thirty fourth street north you know you're going to use local slang and terminology that um especially once you throw it through a translator is going to be very, very foreign to you, and you're not going to be able to find it. And um, 
you know, Wikimap is so great for for providing niche sort of context like that. And um, th this was a tough one to, you know, it was, it was easy enough, I guess, to find where it was. Um, but the nature of what it was, I think, even now I'm still struggling to understand um, what, exa <laughs> what exactly I mean, it was. Historically, <laughs> armies love to use resorts as headquarters, barracks, and sort of other installations because mm. they're, they're set up very well for, for those activities. They're, they're usually sort of self-contained. They have pre sort of cut out smaller buildings um you know there's there's a little level of infrastructure already there um and so continue like le legitimately if you look through history of the past hundred years um armies just constantly are using resorts as you know these facilities um and so this this wasn't very vague in in when when i see you know they hit a resort with with a, a number of rockets i'm like oh that's a headquarters facility that's being used for something um it, it it's just this this instant sort of connection there's also this weird um and i don't think i've really shared about it i i did share some screenshots from an instagram weird drama related to this resort it's called like the Privil something something restaurant and um i was originally linked to an article that mentioned um the owners of the church that is right next door i i believe off property but there is some sort of working relationship at least pre-war um uh they were interviewed i it might have been by pravda as well um uh where essentially they they said that they have, they were being harassed and bullied um post occupation um russian forces were using the church as barracks um and were picking food off of trees or picking produce off of trees and whatnot um and were apparently looting and pillaging the the resort nearby as well uh, i then shared these screenshots from that resort's instagram today where like it's two separate posts and one of them kind of claims that there was no military on the property and like it was like a you know unwarranted strike and then the next post uh says that like five people died and um there's that video that of course was shared of of you know russian soldiers literally you know bleeding out so to speak um it was obviously a military strike but i guess i didn't expect to get roped into this weird drama regarding the owner of the restaurant basically gaslighting people on instagram it was kind of a an unexpected thing to wake up to yeah and and that strike i i, I don't know um if you've seen the the video that's just been posted into our group chat um it would appear that that strike on that facility is, is perhaps not the only one um that has sort of hit russian used barracks type buildings this week um I don't know if you want to have a look at that video now. Um, just see if it's the same location or if this is a different building now. Um, oh, hold on, let me find it. But I'm looking. clearly, the Ukrainians are stepping up their attacks now. On not not just obviously we've seen a lot of attacks on Russian uh, vehicles and stuff over the last few months, and now we're seeing a lot more attacks against sort of the infrastructure, the, the, the headquarters buildings air bases and so on uh, the way i had always you know thought of this uptick we're noticing is is you know number one it is it is a rotational period uh, mm. for sure for ukrainian forces um i think it would be um not stupid to therefore conclude it's it's the same period for russian forces as well um where as the front line has of course collapsed in, in kyrgyzstan so you're seeing you know ukrainian assets rotate east um, I think you're seeing a lot of, of you know, uh, barrack activity where there's there's a, there's a turnover like that, um, and you know I think it also a lot of it has to do with with the temperature and the weather as well. There's there's an inclination to more time indoors, um, and you know taking those barracks out in the middle of winter. I mean, where where do they sleep now? <laughs> I mean, wh where where especially when it goes to high-ranking officers, which I, I don't think it would be too foolish to believe a good bit of that um, 
resort that was destroyed, I, I really do feel like a good bit of the, the gentlemen there were um, officers, if not high-ranking officers. Um, you know, those are taken out of circulation now, and, you know, luckily more or less has been mild the last couple of days, but it's it's still frigid in a good part of the country, and um, I think you're going to continue to see it to happen, and um, that's either going to... Um, you know, force those rotations maybe ahead of time, perhaps, um, you know, troops that maybe just got back or just resting up um, are now going to have to move to the front line. Um, or there's going to have to be some sort of logistical, you know, nonsense where they have to withdraw even further away from the front line, which kind of takes away their, you know, effectiveness, uh, were, there be, were there to be a counter-offensive later on in the winter. I think we will probably call it a day there, because that's, yeah, <laughs> I'm going for a good hour, if you can believe that. Um, to make it easier for him to find the edit point. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Um, I hope you get some sleep. It's, it's quite <laughs> late. Not like anybody is surprised as I hear you talk. I think I can hear you yawning in between every um, syllable. So please get some sleep. I was going to say, I don't think that's me yawning. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, this has been season four, episode 11 of the OSINT Bunker podcast. Um, thank you again to Intel Crab for joining us this evening. Um, next episode will be the season finale, and we are due to have a large number of our sort of previous guests from both this season and previous seasons joining us for effectively a Christmas special. Um, it probably won't be so focused on current events. It will probably end up just being an absolute mess. Um, but we will be bringing back a, a large number of our previous guests and possibly some new voices as well. So um, be sure to look out for that, uh, hopefully releasing round about Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. Um, this episode will hopefully be up uh, sort of within the next 24 hours. Um, so thank you very much for listening um, and we will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>